Hello, everyone. Hey, Welcome. everyone. Hi, Frank. Hey, Chris. So we're back at the AAS YouTube channel, and we're continuing on with taking your teaching online tools and tips. And today we're going to cover the topic of citizen science in your course. Chris, you want to start off with something? Um, sure. I mean, I don't want to be negative to start at all, but I'm going to do the ask, a couple of asterisks about citizen science first, just be, okay. for people who think, oh, that sounds great. I'm going to jump right in. Um, they're not huge asterisks. I mean, it's it's an ex excellent component of an astronomy course for non-science majors, an introductory level course. And I've used several citizen science projects in the past and successfully. Um, the only caveats are that you have to pick your project fairly carefully because if, if we're framing this as teaching non-science majors, you know, the big introductory class, um, this is not actually the core audience for most citizen science projects. Citizen science projects have been have involved looping in the science interested general public into doing scientifically meaningful jobs and, and then actually publishing research papers based on it, one of the successes of citizen science. But that sort of self-selected audience is pretty is pretty highly motivated. I mean they're closer, I would say they're sort of closer the core citizen science, the avid citizen scientist is closer to an amateur astronomer than to a introductory astronomy student. So just, just bear in mind that the motivation level of your students are doing something that's too complicated or, you know, it really intensive uh, is limited. So, so sort of keep it in a, you know, keep it in a box that's not too big as a part of your course or, or too much work because they're not probably going to go the extra uh, crazy miles. The anecdotal stories in citizen science are amazing. You know, early on of citizen scientists who were, you know, asked to classify 50 galaxies and some of them, you know, did 100,000 or something. The long tail of people with a lot of time on their hands and a lot of interest. You know, okay, so that's not your audience. We understand. So that, that's one little caveat, just to keep it, you know, pick the project carefully, not make the task too long, complicated, cumbersome the learning curve too steep and the best citizen science is set up that way anyway uh, and keep it to a you know a fairly modest component of a course and the other uh, just advisory is that um, citizen science projects sort of it's not a binary thing but they do divide a little bit into uh, needle in a haystack type projects which like looking for gravity wave signals or or you know, trying to dig out a few more exoplanet transit curves from noisy Kepler data. And again, the, in the same vein, those require a little more application and, and stick to itness than might be appropriate in your class or might be meaning realistic in your class. And then there are others that are just very well defined. Um, they're sort of immediately obvious what's being asked of the participant and they're, they're a little more manageable. Um, and because there's a lot of citizen science projects. And then I guess the last thing I'd say is just, it's useful to have a little background for people who don't know. Um, this is a thing where we astronomers can be very proud because citizen science, you know, essentially started with astronomy. It's now spawned off hundreds and hundreds of projects in all areas of physical, life science, social science, anthropology, archaeology, art, what, what name it. I mean, there's citizen science projects, ornithology, everything you can think of. Yep. Uh, it's an incredible phenomenon now. But, you know, a Galaxy Zoo was 2007. Uh, Chris mm -hmm. Lintott, uh, who's now at the University of Oxford. Yep. Uh, and, you know, astronomy was in on the ground floor of this. And Galaxy Zoo still, still exists, and it's many times reincarnations. So astronomers have been front and center in citizen science. We can be very proud of it as a profession. And, and that's a good reason on its own to use it in your class. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, just to go back on that, you know, astronomy was sort of the, uh, you know, the mothership of it all was study at home, right? Where people would take radio data and, you know, hunt for alien signals. Um, that's still an active project. Uh, it's, it's currently under the Boink banner. So there's really two big banners, one being Boink, which has lots of projects under it. Um, and then uh, Zooniverse, Galaxy Zoo has many projects underneath that. 
So I've used SETI at home. I primarily teach an um, introduction to planetary um, solar systems course. And so SETI lends, lends itself real easy to that. And, you know, of course, Are We Alone is one of the big drivers and all non-science students love to go after that question, right? Um, so I have put it in, and again, I don't, I don't give credit for, you know, discovering alien signals or discovering um, green peas or Annie's boo rip, if I said that right. <clears throat> um, but it's just the participation, right? To go ahead and do one work unit. So one work unit typically in a SETI is, you know, will take, you know, half an hour or so of, of compute time. Uh, and they get their, their credit and they can talk about uh, whatever they like um, about SETI within having contributed. And one of my goals, um, and Chris mentioned this in the beginning, is, is um, to inspire enough interest in the non-science students so that they may want to continue doing some citizen science project uh, after they leave the course, so whether this be SETI or whether it happens to be categorizing um, flowers and botany. I mean, there's just so many citizen science projects that you can almost certainly find one that will appeal to somebody's um, interest and background. So I do, uh, I do aim future forward when I put it in. And it's a small component, right? Five, 10 points. It's right. like anything else, just participation. Uh, game but you'd be surprised how many often how many much effort people will put in on relatively low value uh, items relative to the course and it's one of the it's one of these pieces of an astronomy coursework that you know when kids are doing it and get into it they're kind of learning a lot of astronomy without even realizing they're learning astronomy it's a sort of almost an effortless way to to do that um so so uh frank talked about blink and the study at home that's a big original piece of um, citizen science. I'll talk about Galaxy Zoo, which still mm -hmm. exists, because it's, it's the other sort of founding pillar, if you like, of astronomy citizen science. So, um, I mean, Galaxy Zoo, again, started in 2007. Um, in its first wave or incarnation, I think I had almost a million participants classify 10 or 15 million galaxies, just an you know, amazing amount of work. It's, it's sort of gone, uh, you know, it's sort of re, uh, reanimated. If you go to the Galaxy Zoo website, um, you know, you'll find the current incarnation of it, which I think uses data from the Candles project. So original Galaxy Zoo used the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and had people classifying galaxies yep. um, by morphology. Um, and they've revisited Galaxy Zoo, reanimated it with different data sets, deeper data sets, and the Candles is a good example. It's a Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, imaging data set of nearby galaxies, beautiful data. Um, and, and the gist of it is, which was, you know, a great original motivator, that galaxy classification as a task is one of those things that's almost immune to auto fully automating. Because they're really, because galaxies obviously have symmetries and structures that are familiar to most astronomers, but the symmetries are not perfect, the details matter. You know, the bulges can be subtle, the asymmetries can be subtle, there might be a supernova sitting on top of a spiral arm. All sorts of interesting things can be happening in a galaxy. And, and it's been traditionally hard to get automated processes that find all of that, or even that classify galaxies, um, you know, perfectly. And also, the, a, an attentive person with good eyes and a good brain can do it as well as professionals. So the original, one of the great early papers out of Zooniverse, was pitted a hundred citizen scientists against a hundred professional astronomers, including you know Alan Dressler and you know sort of fellows of the National Academy level galaxy researchers. And on average, the citizen scientists classified galaxies as reliably as professional astronomers. So again, if you you want to put a little, if you're doing Galaxy Zoo and you want to motivate it in your syllabus, just just put that out there. You know, like this is something you can probably do as well as a fellow of the National Academy in astronomy, um, because it just requires you to be paying attention and sensitive to your to color differences or symmetry differences. And so in Galaxy Zoo, the training is fairly simple. You're given pairs of images, you're doing binary classification or led through a little training set and you're told what the goals are, what to look for. It's not too many things, it's, it's fairly finite. 
and then you're unleashed on a real data set. And it might be 50, in, in a class, you might have a kid, a student do 50 galaxies, maybe 100, 50 is enough. And again, it can just be participation. There's not always a right answer anyway. It's, it's a process where you're just trying to apply yourself. And of course, the message, the, the lessons attached to this are about stellar populations, about how galaxies form, how they behave, about, you know, the, there are all sorts of good uh, pieces of astronomy that get taught in this. So Galaxy Zoo is right there at the beginning and whatever version of their project is currently running is, is a good one to do even now. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, I don't have too much more to add on this. Uh, Maybe we just we can just throw out a few other you know types of project. Um, I, I would add that uh, in terms of umbrellas for citizen science, NASA has you know got mm -hmm. got well well on board on citizen science. Um, so there's um, there's one that I'm familiar with. I, I've had students uh, you know our students play with it, but not used it in a big class called Disk Detective, which is mm -hmm. um, it's based on the WISE survey, NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey. Uh -huh. uh, and you're actually looking for, so protoplanetary disks. Okay. And, you know, so it's, it's mostly a field full of stars and unresolved objects, and you're looking for those little subtle signatures of, of disks and so on. So that's a nice one. Um, let's see, what's another one? There's a, uh, a lensing one called Space Warps that's asking you to look for, uh, either uh, lensed objects in the sense of them forming double or multiple images, which are pretty rare, or more commonly uh, showing the sheer distortions turning into little arcs, which happens in a gravitational lensing situation. So that's a, there's a lensing project uh, called Space Warps. Um, let's see, what other, I'm not thinking of any others right now, but there, but pretty much every field of astronomy, you'll find um, a citizen science project. Oh, and I'll just throw one in as long as you uh, toggle me on that one. Um, it's true that most of them are, are of an observational bent, but there are theoretical ones. For example, people will do large scale, um, large scale cosmology simulations and hunting through that data set or analyzing part of that data set. Uh, they also have citizen science projects. So if your students have to run, happen to run a little bit more on the theory side of the house, there are citizen science projects in that as well. Or in closer to home, um, you know, there are, uh, and again, another NASA sponsored project, there's one called Planet Four that involves looking at images of Mars and looking at, looking at geolo for particular geological features on Mars, you know, you're given a direction, you're not just presented with landscapes and have to make sense of it. There's one also, I think NASA, under NASA's umbrella called Asteroid Hunter, where you're looking at time-lapse images mm -hmm. uh, to see the things that move in a time-lapse image where most stars don't night to night. And that's, again, a meaningful uh, activity because that's, that's how we find these objects anyway. And particularly for near-Earth objects, right? They're looking yeah. for potential smaller impactors. Um, yeah, so that's the one has some sort of immediate impact. And a website you can go to for some of these is called CosmoQuest because it, it's, it's uh, the umbrella organization that's enlisted the public to make maps and identify features on the moon, Mars, Mercury, and I think Vesta also. So, um, and if you want to get all historical and in a slightly different vein, there's a thing, there's a project called Astronomy Rewind, which is using volunteers to map and digitize images, sky images from old astronomical journals that have never been digitized. So maybe not the best fit to an astronomy course, but it's an, again, another flavor of work uh, for the, in this category. All right, so I guess the sort of the takeaway is there's lots and lots of options you can put in your online course and uh, how you choose to do it is of course up to you, um, but uh, it's an avenue well, <clears throat> well worth considering uh, participation, both within the class and again, trying to get beyond the class so that there's some, some lasting value to the student and to the science, particularly astronomy. And, you know, in your course evaluations, you know, if, if you evaluate the individual components of your course, you, you'll probably find that oh, yeah. you do this 
for some fraction of your students, they will love it. They'll totally love it. You may spawn, uh, a, you know, an Uber or citizen scientist after the fact that you, you know, you remember their name and you read about them a few years later, having classified, you know, <laughs> a thousand galaxies or discovered something or written yeah. a research paper. Yeah. Uh, citizen science, I think that's a little statistic I can throw out near the end here on uh, citizen science. You can see it on the Zooniverse. A website just just so that the typo the terminology is clear galaxy zoo was their founding project out of chris lintott and his group and it in blossomed or recast into zooniverse and so zooniverse is the umbrella site that now includes 100 or 115 projects that are well outside of astronomy now but include astronomy projects anyway i think the galaxy zoo site is now upward of 150 research papers, refereed publications mm -hmm. that have citizen science authors or co-authors, sometimes first authors. So uh, the, the archetype of citizen science from some of the founders was to do research level work. Now that's not what we're talking about today, but that has been a real product of citizen scientists. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep, very cool. And of course, most of you know Chris Lintott, who also happens to be the uh, scientific editor for the uh, Laboratory Astrophysics Software and Data Corridor of the journals, and he's also the editor of Research Notes. Um, so, in fact, uh, I'll put a link down below. We just did a little chat with Chris uh, about three weeks ago. I'll put a link to that in the description down below. Um, very cool. I'm good. You good? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening in on this one on citizen science, and we'll see you on the next ones. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone.